Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So first up, hopefully one of the first things you should notice is that my voice has come back uh, thanks to some fairly strong steroids that I've uh, sprayed up my nose. Um, so uh, kudos to the NHS for sorting out my problem and uh, I can now talk to you again in full uh, surround sound Matt Easton voice uh, as you used to enjoy it again. So the point of this video is to really say in a nutshell um, that one of the pitfalls of interpretation of weapon use and in fact it goes beyond weapon use it could be any historical skill or historical pastime or sport or art even um, is that fundamentally when modern experimental archaeologists or reenactors or whoever pick up a tool or a weapon or uh, try to make something from the past one of the very first problems, and one of the problems that often gets overlooked, and yet is really the biggest problem, is that, you know what, we're not historical people. Um, and this is a really big problem. Uh, a lot of people make quite kind of sweeping uh, conclusions about the way that technology, be it weapons or, or some type of tool, or farming implement or whatever, from the past was used based on their frame of reference and their perspective. And the problem is that just physically, and not to, of course, mentally, we are very different people compared to people of the past. And I won't necessarily say that the further back you go, the more true that gets, but certainly some historical periods produced people who were further removed, both physically and mentally, from what we are now. Uh, so, for example, if you're reading a uh, Victorian bayonet manual, then in actual fact you might find that quite applicable to a modern person because they were written for noobs, or at least the system was written to train noobs, uh, new recruits, privates into the army, in an age in the 19th century when people were fundamentally quite similar to what we are now. Okay? We're not very different to 19th century people. If you read a 19th century novel, for example, um, then you'll see that essentially they had a pretty similar outlook on the world to, to what we have now. However, medieval people, for example, in some cases had really, really different outlooks on the world uh, to what we have now. You know, they, uh, many of them had very different religious views to what many of us have, have now, and very different scientific views, and views about equality of genders and races, and social classes and what their rights were and what they could expect from life they were in many ways different to us and that's just to do with the mind what I really want to focus on in this video because it's most pertinent to fighting arts or maybe not necessarily most pertinent but certainly it is it's pertinent to the the techniques of fighting arts um, because I don't want to suggest that mentality isn't important to uh, fighting arts of course it is uh, in actual fact, a, a, a way of thinking, a philosophy, very much structures or can very much influence um, a fighting art. And we see this with um, certain Asian martial arts, for example, or, you know, the, the, the effects that Zen has on, on the practice of Japanese martial arts, for example, um, and uh, Buddhism on uh, Chinese martial arts and so on and so forth. And undoubtedly this was true in medieval and pre-Christian Europe as well. Um, <clears throat> but... Focusing on the physical aspect, one of the problems I often see that often kind of like rings alarm bells in my head when I'm reading not so much HEMA people and not so much reenactors actually, but more experimental archaeologists in particular, um, one of the things that sets off alarm bells is when they make conclusions about what is physically preferable or physically advantageous without seeming to take into consideration that the people of the time using those weapons, for example a spear and shield, were probably very different physically to an average modern archaeologist. Now I have to say, I'm, I'm a former archaeologist, but I have um, friends who have stuck with archaeology and um, archaeologists for the most part tend to be fairly fit because they spend a lot of time out in the field moving things around and digging. 
Uh, obviously, this is not the academic archaeologists so much. The, this is more the actual field archaeologists. Um, so they tend to be fairly fit. However, the type of physical activity they do is nevertheless fairly different to what a 9th century farmer did or what a, um, you know, a, a 15th century knight did. Different types of physical activity. Now, specific examples. So here I have, you can't see the top of this because this is my new spear and it's pretty damn long. It's about 8 foot long. It has a um, Anglo-Saxon type leaf shaped head on the end there. That's a fairly large one. Carbon steel forged in the traditional method with um, a um, softer steel core and hard steel edges um, socketed on a authentic type of ash shaft uh, and the whole assembly is around eight foot long. So this is fairly big uh, but it is also a, a type a size of spear that was um, popular right across the ages. Eight foot is quite a quite a common size for a spear, I would say, in many different periods, certainly in the Anglo-Saxon and Viking era, but equally later in the, uh, in the sort of late Middle Ages as well. Now, you'll notice I've immediately gone to this position, the, um, the overarm, as I would call it, the overarm stabbing position with my shield, as is often shown in artwork. It's shown, obviously, in ancient, in Greek and um, Macedonian uh, kind of era, art, but it is equally shown in Viking era art, and it's still shown in late medieval art as well. Now, as I've spoken about before, and as many people out there have spoken about, there is an ongoing debate about the, the usefulness of overarm grip versus essentially holding it like a sword, okay? And the thing that everybody pretty much notices, to begin with, is that this is far less tiring than the overarm grip. Okay? Now, um, this isn't a video about overarm versus underarm, okay? because I've done one of those before and I'll probably do a more in-depth and advanced one in the future based on the fact that I've now got more experience with Spear and Shield. Um, but what this is really to say is one of the major objections that people have when they, when they do this grip, and I think one of the main reasons why people try and argue against using this more, using this as much as it's shown in the art, and it really is shown a lot in the art, is that essentially they're a bit weak, okay, and that's my main point, is that most people have pretty weak shoulders. Now bear in mind, I teach a weekly sabre class. I have, over the years, had literally hundreds of noobs come through my club. Some of them have sport fencing experience, some of them have reenactment experience, some of them have other HEMA experience. But one of the things that we find is that when, I'll just put the um, spear down for a second, <coughs> when we get people, ignore the fact that this is a Viking sword for a second, when we get people standing in this sabre guard of high second, very quickly in the class, the new people, their deltoid muscles get very tired, very, very quickly. However, after a few weeks of doing sabre, their shoulders quickly strengthen up. And this is the point. The point is that a lot of people make conclusions about weapon use based on their current physical fitness. And it's not a general fitness, it's not your ability to run however many miles you can run or how many laps of the swimming pool you can do. It's not, it's not that type of fitness, it's type of fitness for a specific physical activity. And most people will find on picking up a shield and spear that their shield, shield arm initially will get very, very tired. They're not very good at holding a shield out for very long. And equally, if they're repeatedly stabbing with a spear over arm like this, that their shoulder's pretty weak. And very often, they'll switch to this grip because they can keep going for longer. Okay? So, my main point is don't make conclusions about a physical you know, activity or a certain type of weapon or how a certain type of weapon was used until you've been using it for, for you know, at least weeks and preferably months uh, because it really, really takes weeks or months for your body and your system of movement and it's not always about pure strength and uh, fitness it's sometimes about economy of movement and learning to move in the right way so that you're not expending too much energy to do that activity until you've done that activity and used those weapons for a few months, 
don't make hard and fast conclusions about how those weapons are used because you'll probably come to the wrong conclusions. Okay. Next, and related to that, this also goes for the Viking era sword grip, which as you know I've started examining and started using. I'm applying very much the same philosophy to this type of sword. Many reenactment versions of Viking swords have hilts that are too long. You cannot learn anything about the Viking era sword by using a replica that's very different from a Viking era sword. You must have the small confined grip. Okay? And I'm finding already after a few weeks of, of having this type of sword that my way of moving it and my way of holding it and swinging it and everything is changing based on experience. And um, I'll be completely honest about this uh, fact that before I got one of these, and my whole point was I wanted to, I realised it was a very different type of sword to what I was used to, and I viewed it as a new challenge and a new experiment. Before I got one of these, I had some theories. Some theories based on lots of research I've done over the years and experience I've got using other types of swords, including tulwars and arming swords and sabres and various other types of swords. And based on that experience and knowledge and research, I had some theories about what I thought I was going to discover about this hilt. And by and large, not totally, but by and large, mainly, I was completely wrong. <laughs> okay? Um, and the fact is that actually having the thing in hand and then spending time doing things with it has really changed my thoughts about how this type of hilt operates and um, more importantly why it was designed like that. And you have to think very much about the fact that you can pick up a weapon and use it in a number of ways. However, if a weapon has evolved to be a certain shape and a certain size and a certain weight, there is a reason for that. It, it was optimised for to do a specific thing in a specific way. So there we go guys, the uh, conclusion of this video, which I told you at the beginning but hopefully I've illuminated it and, and, and explained it a bit more deeply now, is don't make conclusions or make hard arguments for weapons being used a certain way until you've spent a decent amount of time trying to use them in a variety of different ways. And this is especially true of the overarm spear. Okay? Um, lots of people, I think, sideline it and don't use it enough because they find it tiring. Basically, work it, get your muscles and get your body used to it, experiment with it, and then come up with more informed opinions about its strengths and weaknesses. Okay, let your body actually get used to the physical activity first. Cheers guys! Click subscribe now and also follow us on Facebook.